Well, the World Watch List is something I've been paying attention to and following for the past several years, and I think it's really, really important to be reminded of the global church and to be reminded that we're not alone and that the body of believers stretches across the globe. Open Doors sheds light into Christianity in parts of the world that you will never see, uh, that you'll never set foot in in most of these places, and they tell the stories of those believers all around the world there are Christians who are being mistreated, persecuted, killed, simply for their faith, for identifying as a Christian or following Jesus. In America, persecution looks different, right? Uh, we don't see that face-to-face -face very often. It looks a lot different, but we are more than just one body in one country, right? We know this. We often lose sight of this. We are more than that. We are one church that covers the entire world. That there are Christians all over this globe that follow the same God and the same Jesus that we do, yet their life looks so different because of the circumstances they find themselves in where they live. One church, one global church. But here's what we often forget. We forget that not everyone lives the type of lives that we do and that they don't get to live out their faith in the same way that we do as well. There are parts of the world where following Jesus is costly, it's dangerous, and it's difficult. We looked at this verse last week from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul says this, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. And guys, here's the deal. There are parts of the body that are suffering. We lose sight of this. In the city of Mosul in Iraq, Christians who have been identified as followers of Jesus are given some ultimatums. They're told to either pay a tax, uh, to give one of their girls, like one of their daughters or sisters, to the jihad, uh, to, to donate them, uh, or to convert to Islam, to leave the country, or if you don't do any of those things, then we will kill you. Thousands of Christians displaced for, for their faith by jihadists, and no one, no one protects the Christians, not in Iraq. This year, in Nigeria, Boko Haram has been continuing their establishment of the Islamic State by burning homes of Christians and raiding villages to kill them or displace them, all for their faith. In North Korea, it's illegal to own a Bible. You cannot be a Christian in in North Korea, if you're found to be a Christian, you will face labor camps for the rest of your life until they're ready to dispose of you and to replace your number in the cell. In Afghanistan, converting to Christianity gives your family the permission, the legal government permission, to kill you so they can save their family's honor. In Somalia, the Al-Shabaab militant group targets anyone they suspect of being Christians simply so that they can execute you publicly so that no one else will be encouraged to be a Christian. In Libya, uh, a country that has about 7 million people in their country, there's about 150 Christians. There's no freedom of religion. There's no freedom of speech. Christians are prevented from sharing their faith, and if they do so, they openly will face imprisonment. This is the world all around the globe. Christians have to make life and death situations, decisions, all the time because of their faith. We, we've got to remember this. this is, these are people that are like us, that follow God, that love Jesus, that want to be united with him, and all because of where they were born or where, they, where their home is, they're being persecuted for their faith. When I was in India um, a year and a half ago, I had the a really powerful experience because one of the things that we got to do with CICM is uh, when we were at their conference they brought in some people um, to sit with us who were on the trip and there was about there's maybe eight of us who were there together me and Mike Shelia then um, some other people from another church and we sat in a room and one by one they brought in people to tell their story their stories of persecution what has happened to them, what has happened to their family, over and over and over for about two hours. It was exhausting. Surat, who was um, 
an older gentleman, but who had his house burned down, and his daughter was kidnapped, all because he was a Christian. He became a Christian. Sujit, who was an, an older woman, who you could physically see on her face, had, had just been tormented by this. But her story, which she couldn't even tell, uh, she had to have someone else there to tell her story. She couldn't physically bring the words out to tell her story. But Sujit, what was, her whole family was kicked out of their village. When they found out that they had converted to Christianity, they were kicked out of their village, and a violent mob came in and ran them, physically ran them out of their village, chased them into the river, she hid into the reeds. So I think she was a little bit younger. She hid into the reeds to hide from these people. And she watched. She watched her brother and her father be stabbed to death right there. And this whole experience for me was something I'll never forget because persecution became like a real thing. And not just something that we saw on the screen or, or something that we heard. But now I'm hearing face to face people tell me stories of because I became a Christian, this is what has happened to me. Over and over their stories were just exhausting to hear. And all that we could do, because we could not do anything else, we couldn't go into their village and, and try to bring justice. We, could, we didn't have the resources to do anything about this. We were just tourists. All we could do was pray. And that's what we did. These aren't fabricated stories. These are real things that happen to real and decent people, all because they choose to follow Jesus. And so that's what we did, is we just sat there and prayed for them. Face to face, asking God to keep them strong in the midst of all this. So what about you? What do you do with this? What do you do with the understanding of one in eight Christians around the world face persecution for their faith? What do you do knowing that there are parts of the world, there are parts of the world where, where Christians are having to hide their faith to save their life? What do you do with that? You're a teenager here in central Indiana. What can you do? We learn this in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. It's on the screen. It says this. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some of you who have done this have entertained angels without even realizing. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own body. Remember them. Feel their pain. In fact, one of the other organizations that I follow closely is called the Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, you maybe have heard that or are familiar with them as an organization. And they have this motto when it comes to persecuted Christians that they say this, We will not let them suffer in silence. We will not let them serve alone. In fact, continually when these organizations open doors, Voice of the Martyrs, other people that work with persecuted Christians... When they are asking Christians what they need and how they can help, what, we, what they have learned over and over again is that these persecuted Christians are not asking for help to help the persecution stop. They're asking for prayer from the church to help them endure it. Think of the difference between those two things. They're not asking for the persecution to stop. They're asking for prayer for strength to endure it. And so that's what we'll do. That is what we will do. If we can't uh, put together the monies, if we can't go across seas, if we can't physically be there to help the fight against persecuted Christians, the least that we can do as we sit in this room tonight, as one body, as one church, one global church, we will pray. We will pray for them, and we will ask God to give them the strength to endure it. We all need to be reminded of our brothers and sisters across this globe that face persecution. And I think what we learn from Hebrews is that not only do we need to remember them, but we need to experience and to feel their pain as well.